I'm here. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Fecal Lactoferrin Measurements in Clinical Practice, presented by Dr. Paul Rufo, an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and program director, HMS Fellowship in Pediatric Gastroenterology at Boston Children's Hospital. I'm Dr. Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is a leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, type the questions into the drop-down box that appears on that screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on that Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use that Ask a Question box and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process for obtaining your credits. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Paul Rufo. Dr. Rufo is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and the program director of Harvard Medical School Fellowship in Pediatric Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Boston Children's Hospital. He's a senior associate in the Center for Inflammatory Bowel at Boston Children's Hospital and is affiliated with Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Brigham and Women's Hospital. His research is focused on the development of new modalities for use in the diagnosis and interval assessment of children and adults with IBD. His research also involved the development of new therapies for inflammatory bowel disease, as well as quality assurance initiates in this patient population. Dr. Rufo received his medical degree from the University of Massachusetts Medical School and an MMSC degree from Harvard Medical School. Please join me now in welcoming our presenter, Dr. Paul Rufo. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, everybody, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk about uh, lactoferrin and biomarkers. This is an area that I have had a longstanding interest, myself and others have had a longstanding interest, and I hope over the course of the next hour I can impart on you some of my enthusiasm for why I think lactoferrin and other biomarkers are important and will become increasingly important as we move forward in this, this age of limited medical resources. And uh, I hope to give you an idea practically of how one can think about using uh, lactoferrin measurements in clinical practice. And I do welcome questions. I'll run through the slides, uh, which should take about 45 to 50 minutes, and I'm going to budget about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. So I hope everybody uh, feels free to, to write down their questions, and then, and then we'll run through them uh, as we move forward. So... I'll just say that uh, in terms of disclosure, uh, you've heard a lot of, of different things. Uh, I have been working with Tech Lab uh, for some number of years. I'm a speaker for Abvi and a consultant for Loophold and Shire, and uh, that's what I have to disclose. Uh, as I said earlier, we're going to review a little bit about biomarkers in general, like lactoferrin, and why they're important, and maybe think about them in a way that you haven't thought about them in the past, and then think about how we can actually use them. They're a great tool, but like any great tool, the question is, how can you use it? It's a it's a good hammer or a good screwdriver, but it's as only as good as the application you you use it for. So I want to give you some practical uh, practical information about how one can use this sort of technology in in day to day or longitudinal management of patients, and then we'll finish with some future directions where biomarker and especially lactoferrin research may take us. And and once ago, write those questions down as I move uh, from slide to slide. <clears throat> 
the first few slides are going to be much more in general, and we're just going to talk about biomarkers. And this is how I got involved in the, in the science in the first place. We, as gastroenterologists, are constantly tasked with the, the job of figuring out how our patients are doing, either what they have or uh, what they, how they're responding to our therapies. And, and biomarkers help us, and, and especially important, because you can use them in place. We, we collect them um, with respect to blood or, or radiologic or exam uh, uh, efforts, and we, we come up with an endpoint, a measurement. And we use these biomarkers when we can't get the information we want in a different way. Sometimes it's very difficult to get a particular bit of data due to uh, the need for invasive evaluation. Sometimes it's prohibitive because of patient discomfort or cost, or sometimes it's just impractical because it would require extended periods of observa uh, observation. And we're always tasked by this. How, how can we tell our patients how, how we're doing when what they're doing, especially with respect to IBD, is something that happens on the inside of their body? So we, we can't really readily do endoscopies and colonoscopies on these patients all the time. So the question was, how can we assess this otherwise. And that's really how I fell into the biomarker literature in the latter part of the uh, 1990s um, in an effort to sort of figure out how I could uh, better assess treatment response. And at the time, I was using uh, a new therapy and, and was trying to figure out how I could assess the efficacy of a new therapy without having to rely uh, on serial invasive studies. Um, biomarkers are important to clinicians like us because they can help us make an initial diagnosis. They can help us take a patient who walks in off the street. We can get a history. We can think about what sort of diseases we have. And if we have the right assay, if we have the right biomarker, it will give us uh, a good idea as to whether or not our patient may have or may not have something, and, and both, both aspects are important, the ability to be able to say that someone does have something or doesn't have something. Um, biomarkers are also ideally positioned for longitudinal data. So we initially want to figure out how our patients or what our patients have. This is the, the patient that walks in off the street with with diarrhea or a bloody stool, and we're trying to figure out whether or not it's more or less likely that they have IBD. That's a one-shot deal. Then we give them our diagnosis, and we follow them for the next 20 or 30 years, depending on if we're pediatric or adult gastroenterologists. Um, we need to have a way of assessing their response over time. And one thing that's very good about biomarkers is that they pr provide objective data, with continuous measurements. And lactoferrin is going to fit all of these criteria as we draw this together. And ideal biomarkers can help us predict relapse. They allow a component of proactive management. Most of the, or at least much of the management we do nowadays is reactive. We see a patient who comes to clinic, they report a set of symptoms that may be different from their last clinic visit and we make a change in their management based on that. Wouldn't it be nice if we could figure out which patients were at risk for flaring and we could modify their therapy before they had clinical symptoms? So ideally, uh, biomarkers are gonna help clinicians uh, with respect to proactive uh, management. And then a separate set of biomarkers may actually help us define clinical phenotypes. We may be able to use biomarkers, lactoferrin and others, to figure out which patients are most likely to respond to, to uh, individual therapies, or we might be able to figure out which patients under what circumstances are mo most at risk for uh, particular complications. So 
the the uh, wheelbarrow of information that may be imparted to us by biomarkers is pretty broad. Um, pharma has been one of the primary driving forces for biomarkers in all disease pathways, not just GI, cardiovascular, hypertension, uh, diabetes, the whole thing. And biomarkers are very important to pharma because they help shorten the duration of a study. If you have to assess the response of a drug or an intervention on a patient population, the last thing you want to have to do is wait two years, five years, ten years. If you're thinking about a medication that might affect uh, heart disease or heart attack, the last thing you want to do is want to wait 20 years or 30 years to see who develops heart attacks. Instead, what you want is a biomarker in in heart disease literature, I suppose they use cholesterol and statin, statins. The efficacy of statins are imparted by, by how they impact on uh, cholesterol measurements. By shortening the duration of the study, they lower the cost of the study. They re reduce morbidity. Subjects are going to be less likely to have to undergo invasive testing or stay on a study for a longer period of time and hopefully improve accrual. So the studies that you see in your journals, whether they be the pediatric journals or the New England Journal, they're going to look at biomarkers and you're going to see them reported as outcome variables precisely for this reason, because investigators, not just in big pharma, but investigators are going to be leveraging these biomarkers to provide expedient information to their readers and hopefully change uh, clinical care in the short run. Biomarkers are also important to researchers. Everybody is a researcher, to my view, and I tell that to the fellows in our program all the time. We're all interested in taking existing information and using it in the best way for the next patient. And researchers can be people who spend time trying to do big studies or write manuscripts. Researchers, in the broadest sense, can also be people who are, who are looking to adapt technology. And when you, when you broaden the definition of researcher to include that population of people, we're all researchers. And I provided here sort of a pathway that uh, I think is relevant for thinking about things like IBD, but probably more generic with respect to just about any disease process. There is some sort of stimuli from the environment in GI. It may be a bacteria or a bacterial product or some microbiome that we don't fully understand. And that stimuli is imposed on patients who have some genetic vulnerability. And that, for reasons that aren't fully clear, initiate an inflammatory cascade that will eventually bring patients to our office. Somewhere along the line, our patients with inflammatory bowel disease, whether it be ulcerative colitis or, or Crohn's disease, experience something in the environment. We still don't know, but we do know that they have a genetic vulnerability. People a whole lot smarter than myself are trying to figure out what those genetic vulnerabilities are and how they can be uh, mitigated with respect to drug therapy. And then for years, uh, all of us have been trying to manage inflammatory cascades in our patients in a way that we get a better clinical outcome. You can see these green arrows pointing in every different direction. Basically, every step in the ladder gives us an opportunity to develop a biomarker or a readout. It could be in the blood. It could be in the urine. It could be in the stool. That's mostly what we're going to talk about today and it could be in the saliva. So there's a, a left to right flow and we can intervene on any different way to sort of figure out what might be going on and how that can be leveraged to help the next patient. If we understand the patients that we're seeing today and treating today, we might have a better handle on how to treat or at least think about the patients that are gonna be scheduled to see us in clinic in a month or six months. Biomarkers are, are, are going to be true and, and useful in all dimensions. The, the last 
uh, dimension along which biomarkers are going to express the utility is, has to do with overall health care. Now, we all know that we live in a society that has expanding medical knowledge. We're very good at making technologies that cost lots of money. We have a limited budget. And the challenge to the healthcare system in the biggest sense or to healthcare providers like you and me in the smallest sense is to answer the question, how can I provide the best quality of care for the least amount of money? It's easy to provide high quality care for lots of money. I think we can all figure out ways to do that. The question and the challenge and the call to task at this point is how can we provide as good, if not better, care to the patients that we're seeing today for less money? And that's where biomarkers come in. And this sort of loops back to what we talked about in the first slide and, and how biomarkers can replace invasive studies. So we have within our power with the biomarkers that we have available to screen our patients, to have an earlier diagnosis, maybe decrease that lag time because we have ways of, of assessing patients in a way that's palatable and cost effective. We hopefully will develop more ways or, or improved ways of disease monitoring. If we can practice proactive medicine, we'll save money. If we can optimize therapy, if we can take the drugs that we're using now and use them in the most efficacious manner, we'll save money. And the nice thing about that is those drugs are already out there. They're already FDA approved or at least in widespread use. So if we can just, if we can just squeeze the most efficacy out of them, we can, we can save money. If we can prognose our patients, if we can take patients and risk stratify and figure out which patients were most likely to respond to individual therapies or which patients were more likely to uh, develop certain complications, then we can save money. And if we can say, do uh, less in the way of invasive testing, uh, we can certainly save money keeping people out of the operating room of the procedure suite where we spend probably the most money in our field certainly uh, makes, uh, makes a difference and, and certainly improves the bottom line. So I, I think for lots of different reasons, it makes sense to, to think about uh, incorporating biomarkers more and more into the way we think about uh, treating our patients. What are the challenges? I've, I've outlined in the last few slides a lot of different reasons why biomarkers are useful and why I spend my time studying them and why I spend my time telling you that you too may uh, enjoy the benefits, so to speak, of biomarkers in your own practice. But there are some challenges in that remember that with biomarkers, you have to have an endpoint that you're testing against. So biomarkers must have a, valid, a validated endpoint. We all have to agree on uh, what we're measuring to see if biomarkers, whether it be lactoferrin or another marker, meets the endpoint. So if we're talking about endoscopic outcome, then we have to agree on that. If we're talking about a histologic outcome, we have to agree on that. And as I say in the slide, there has to be some sort of gold standard. Right now, I don't think we have a gold standard in GI. We know that patients who feel well are a clinical success. We know that patients who have mucosal healing tend to do better. If you, if you perform a diagnostic or a surveillance endoscopy on someone and you see less in the way of mucosal disease, the likelihood that that patient will stay in remission over time is better than if you do a diagnostic endoscopy and see more disease. Um, if you take a patient, that same patient, and one of them has histologic or deep remission, then that patient is even more likely to stay in remission. So depending upon where you set your mark is going to depend upon where you're asking or at what level you're asking your, your biomarker to perform. Um, there are a number of advantages to using the fecal biomarkers that we're going to talk about today. In the past, the 
first thing we did when people came to our offices and had GI symptoms was stuck a needle in their arm and measured sed rate, CRP, and albumin and used those data points to determine how sick our patients were because that's what we had. But we all know that nowadays that sed rate and CRP aren't very specific and that they don't impart information uh, entirely in line with GI disease and could be reflective of any disease process or any inflammatory process or infectious process. When you use fecal biomarkers, you're getting uh, values or proteins that are reflective of the underlying GI disease. So changes in fecal markers should reflect changes in the underlying GI physiology. Our fecal biomarkers provide continuous measurements. We're replacing subjective measurements with, I think he is doing better, or I think she hasn't responded, to now numbers. We're saying their number has fallen. Now, what that fall in the number means is something that we can talk about. And we can say whether or not they're responsive to therapy. Sometimes you see a patient in clinic and the parent feels like they're doing well or the parent feels like the kid is not doing well and, and you have your own ideas and you only see the kid 15 minutes every four months. And the question is, how can you really arbitrate this? How can you, how can you take what is otherwise uh, a philosophic discussion about how well a kid is doing and put it on a more objective, uh, objective platform? And biomarkers are, are enable us to do that. As we move forward... The hope is, is that we develop more easily used biomarkers, so maybe biomarkers that people can do at home, and that's uh, in the works and under development with, with different co uh, companies. You can find out that you are pregnant for about $9 with a kit that you buy at CVS or some other pharmacy with no prescription and no doctor involved. To find out if you have ulcerative colitis in this country costs about ten to fifteen thousand dollars when you add the cost of all the testing. So our hope is that over time we can come up with fecal biomarkers that are going to move the cause uh, more in the direction of cheaper, more easily uh, easily obtained samples. Disadvantage is uh, it requires our patients to collect stool studies are stool with them. They either provide it in the office or they bring it in from home. That's requiring a little bit of a culture change. Now, I must say that since we published our first study a while back, that patients have become more desensitized towards collecting serial or, or infrequent stool samples from home. They, they do it when they provide their infectious workup, and now they're more inclined to provide it to look at uh, biomarker samples. And I will have patients uh, ask me for time to time if they can bring or send in a sample for a lactoferrin measurement. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that um, lactoferrin can be done or is typically done at local or regional labs, and it's a send-out, which means that you don't get the data nearly as quickly uh, under those set of circumstances as you do. Point of care testing for quantitative, uh, I'm sorry, for qualitative lactoferrin is available, and that's not very hard to incorporate, and you can talk to your own labs about doing that. That's just going to be a dichotomous plus minus. There is lactoferrin, there isn't lactoferrin. Um, quantitative lactoferrin can be done in house and isn't very difficult. Here at Children's, we do in house quantitative lactoferrin management or lactoferrin levels, so we get them within 24 hours. They run the assay uh, three or four times a week, so it doesn't take very, very long, um, and you can use that, uh, that data in b 2 b management. So where you want to use or how you want to use lactoferrin, you can sort out with your local lab or lab provider and see how expediently they can provide either qualitative or quantitative uh, lactoferrin or biomarker assessments. Let's talk, I, I spent about 15 minutes, 20 minutes talking about biomarkers in general. Let's talk about lactoferrin specifically. It is found in neutrophils. It's abundant. It is evolutionarily selected. It provides a uh, useful uh, measure. It, it uh, sequesters ion, lactoferrin. It promotes opsonization of pathogenic bacteria. It's quantifiable. It's very stable. 
at room temperature, even for days, but don't tell your patients that. They'll, say, they'll save their stool specimens for days before they bring it in, but it is, it is stable for days, and it's measured both in a quantitative and a qualitative way. Um, most assays are standardized, and the cost isn't tremendous. $100, $200, maybe even less. So it's readily available and not terribly expensive and certainly a whole lot better than the uh, screen for fecal leukocytes that we used to use. So I thought it might be useful to present the rest of the talk in terms of some clinical scenarios that we might be able to relate to. And what I'm hoping for is that you hear these stories and it prompts you to think of instances in your own practice where you think lactoferrin may have been useful or might have been useful or misled you, in which case we can clarify um, where things went amiss. So a 12, these are all made up stories, of course. A 12-year-old boy presents with diarrhea and weight loss. First time you see him in the clinic referred from a pediatrician. You're concerned about the possibility of a chronic inflammatory process. Maybe the first question you ask yourself or maybe the primary care doctor who, who saw the patient before you and is a little bit more proactive and prospective wonders, can lactoferrin help determine whether or not patients are more or less likely to have an infectious or inflammatory process? Is that patient who has diarrhea, are they more likely to have Salmonella, Shigella, or Campylobacter? Are they more likely, which would maybe require an antibiotic therapy? Are they more likely to have IBD, which is going to require a whole host of therapy? Or is that patient presenting with diarrhea more likely to have lactose intolerance or a viral process? Well, the question is the, the answer to this question is yes. Lactoferrin is ideally positioned to see if people have a, uh, infectious or inflammatory processes. And here's data from uh, a study that was actually done uh, in China. And what they did is they took patients who are hospitalized for diarrheal illness. This was unbiased. They looked at all patients. And um, they wanted to see whether or not lactoferrin would help bin patients. And as you can see in this slide, it's very apparent that patients who have viral illness like rotavirus and norovirus, non-inflammatory processes, uh, more likely to have lower lactoferrin levels, and, and oftentimes 7.5 is used as a cutoff. Patients who have in, inflammatory slash infectious diarrhea, things like salmonella and, camp, uh, and campylobacter, much more likely to have higher lactoferrin measurements. Healthy control patients, um, low levels, uh, at or around the levels seen in patients who have uh, norovirus disease or, or another viral disease. I think uh, I didn't put the numbers in. There's about 40 patients with uh, rota represented here, 28 patients with noro, 31 with salmonella, and, and 17 with, uh, with campylobacter. So you can see that the, the binning thing is fair. Now, what you don't see is lactoferrin discriminating what kind of, of infectious process or inflammatory processes afoot. And, and while these, uh, non why these viral values would certainly uh, differ from the uh, bacterial values, the, uh, there's no statistical difference between patients presenting with salmonella or campylobacter. And that's a weakness of most of the available markers. They do reflect GI disease, but they don't differentiate excuse me, what type of GI disease. Um, if you look at uh, adult patients in a similar type of study, this was done, I believe, in uh, Australia. I'm going to try to draw data sets from populations around the world, both adults and kids, to show that there's a, a generalizable phenomenon here. You can see that uh, using a, a cut of 7.5 uh, milligrams per, per milliliter uh, or gram of, of stool or, or dropping that to 1.25, you can see that there's increasing sensitivity and specificity. Your ability to discern who has an inflammatory process and more importantly to discern who doesn't have an inflammatory pri diarrheal prop, uh, process 
uh, increases considerably. And that's important. That's going to be important in terms of who you may want to treat, either based on uh, an empiric course or based on anticipated studies or um, how you might want to uh, talk to patients about what the prognosis is and the likelihood of, of short or long-term uh, uh, morbidity would be. Uh, this is a different demonstration of data, and we can see here that if you look at lactoferrin levels in patients um, drawn from different populations, it's very apparent that not only patients who have uh, inflammatory uh, or infectious diarrhea, patients who have inflammatory diarrhea like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease have much higher uh, lactoferrin levels than patients who have IBS. I used to refer to IBS as non-inflammatory GI disease. I don't think you can anymore because I think there's so much question as to whether or not there's some subclinical mucosal inflammation that's mediating some of IBS. So I just say it's IBS. Uh, and I'm not even sure you can say it's a functional process anymore. But what you can say is that lactoferrin levels certainly discriminate patients with an inflammatory bowel disease from healthy controls in patients who have IBS, which is relevant, especially when you're seeing patients in a first time and you're thinking about uh, making that diagnosis, that initial diagnosis, risk stratifying, decide who would best benefit from more invasive testing. We know from studies that we've done uh, here at Children's, this was a study that we participated here at Children's. It was also done uh, in conjunction with groups at the Mayo and the University of Chicago, and sort of just repeats the information that you already saw. It's very apparent that when you look at all comers, patients with uh, IBD are more likely to have elevated lactoferrin levels than patients who have either IBS or control. So two different studies, two different populations, but very, very similar results. Um, Another uh, assay that's out there is calprotectin, and you may, in fact, have some questions about calprotectin. There's a lot of literature on calprotectin, maybe a, even a, a bit more literature on calprotectin than lactoferrin. <clears throat> but the, um, the phenomenon that they measure is very similar. Both values, both calprotectin and lactoferrin, are... Um, proteins that are found in neutrophils, they come from the same cell type, and they're both used as metrics for figuring out where white cells are. Where there are white cells, there is lactoferrin. Where there is white cells, where there are white cells, there is uh, calprotectin. And both values are very useful at, uh, are both sensitive and specific for identifying patients with both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and specifically discerning those two patient populations from those with IBS. So you can see that. And they do so in a more sensitive and more specific manner than the existing biochemical biomarkers or serologic biomarkers like CRP. So you get more information about a patient's GI disease if you know uh, the lactoferrin and calprotectin than you do if you have a CRP on hand. So I think that's important to remember that you get much more information from lactoferrin and calprotectin, especially more specific information than you can expect to guess from uh, CRP and sed race. Uh, lactoferrin levels are relevant in both large or small bowel disease. People say, well, if I have a patient who has primarily small bowel Crohn's disease, can I still use lactoferrin? Can I still anticipate that lactoferrin is going to be useful in how I evaluate this patient? And I think you can see the data here uh, from a poster that we uh, uh, presented at, at DDW last year. Uh, demonstrates that, yeah, lactoferrin is, is very effective at both uh, small or large bowel or large and small bowel disease and does so in a manner that's more effective and more sensitive and more specific probably than uh, serologic assays like CRP uh, and white cell measurements. So once again, looking at the stool is going to be much more prognostic, much more useful, much more relevant than looking uh, at the blood. Let's talk about clinical scenario two. That same 12-year-old boy who in the interim has been diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. I'm not going to show you his colon. I'm just going to tell you that he was diagnosed with pancolitis. 
uh, he comes to the office and, and he says he's doing great. Uh, he has no problems, but you have your doubts. 12-year-old kids don't always tell us what they're feeling. They are smart enough and clever enough that they know that if they say they feel poorly, that you're inclined to do more testing. At very least, blood work and stool work, at very most, a follow-up endoscopy and colonoscopy. So we, we condition them very early to let them know that, that they're supposed to tell us that they're feeling fine. The question is, how do you deal with this? And can fecal biomarkers, once you've made that diagnosis and you've identified that population of patients that have ulcerative colitis, can fecal biomarkers like lactoferrin go on and help us to determine if there's been a change in disease activity? Can we say using fecal biomarkers that patients are sicker or better if you want to use simplistic terms? And the answer is yes, once again. Useful in this particular case. Uh, not only the presence or absence of lactoferrin, but the levels will impart information about disease severity. And remember I talked to you initially about lactoferrin and infectious colitis in this population. This is another slide from that article looking at those hospitalized patients. There is a, uh, There are measures of disease activity, metrics for disease activity in kids presenting with viral illness. One of them is the vesicari, not something that I typically use, uh, but um, there is for clinical trials out there an, uh, a metric called the vesicari which sounds like something from Star Wars, I, I just say in passing, but there is a way of assessing uh, patients admitted for diarrhea and bin them into mild, moderate, and severe disease. And you can see here in this figure that it's very apparent that lactoferrin levels correlate uh, or bin uh, according to disease activity. Patients who are sicker, Patients who, by vesicari, have had longer and more severe diarrhea. Patients who may have a temperature or diarrhea, dehydration. These are the different parameters that are included in that metric. Patients who are sicker have higher uh, lactoferrin levels. So you can use the lactoferrin levels in the infected patient, patients with, to figure out how sick they are. Maybe think about how you should tier or gauge their therapy. If you look at patients with IBD, we'll go from the infectious to the inflammatory model. Here you have patients who have active and inactive IBD. This is determined by, I believe we use physician global assessment. This was the study that we did in conjunction. We provided pediatric patients. This is a nice cross-section. There are adult patients from the Mayo and from the University of Chicago. This is a cross-sectional study, and you can see that if you take a population of patients who have active UC, their lactoferrin levels are much higher than patients who have inactive UC, and that's true for Crohn's disease as well. So you see that over time, lactoferrin is dynamic. It will go up when people are sicker. It will go down when people are weller, when they're responding to therapy. So if you see a patient in clinic who is feeling well and has a normal lactoferrin level, and then you see them three months, four months, six months later, and you have a question about whether or not they feel as well as they say they feel, get that lactoferrin level and see if there's a change. And you may get different information from that lactoferrin than you got from the patient. And probably more, pro more productive, more useful, more prognostic information from that lactoferrin than you'll get from a C CRP or a SED rate. This was a different study that we did in our population here at Children's. This is just kids. And what it does is it shows, as you move from left to right, that lactoferrin levels are responsive to change. So if you take a population of patients who have active disease, not on steroids, they have uh, the highest lactoferrin levels. If you treat them with steroids and they're feeling better and they're completing that long taper that we all prescribe, their lactoferrins fall. And if they eventually become inactive and are off steroids altogether, they'll have the lowest lactoferrin levels. And you can see those uh, 
that's true for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and we have the control population there. So lactoferrin does correlate with disease activity both in the context of infectious and inflammatory diarrheal disease, and one can anticipate changes in lactoferrin as indicative of response or lack of response, given the data that we have uh, in front of us right now. Um, if you look at patients who have small bowel disease activity, once again, also very useful. Uh, if you look at Crohn's, this is an adult population, Crohn's disease activity index as a way of assigning either mild, moderate, or severe disease activity, you can see that lactoferrin levels uh, correlate fairly nicely with where, pe where patients are going to be. Patients with severe disease tend to have much higher lactoferrin levels than patients who have mild disease and even more so those in remission. So once again, lactoferrin showing its dynamic value, its, its ability to change over time in response to disease activity, in response to therapy. So given his symptoms, our patients with use is that 12-year-old patient, maybe he's a little bit older. Given his symptoms, our patient with UC returns to his office on steroid therapy. His parents want to know if steroids are working and don't necessarily trust their son's response. This is another example of, of uh, showing the dynamic nature of lactoferrin, and the question is, does fecal markers like lactoferrin, do they correlate with what we might see at endoscopy? And the answer is, it looks like yes, but the, this is really a million slash semi-billion dollar question because this is, goes to the heart of the matter and asks the question, can you confidently use biomarkers like lactoferrin or calprotectin to keep you out of the operating room? In patients who have active disease, it's less a question for patients at diagnosis where the sensitivity and specificity really do uh, sub-select out patients who are unlikely to have significant inflammatory or infectious processes. These are patients who have disease. Well, it seems like, at least in this study, which was done uh, in adults, that disease activity was reflected in lactoferrin levels, and those who had active colonic disease certainly had the highest level. Those who had ileocolonic disease, these, these are patients who have Crohn's disease. Active disease patients tend to have much higher uh, uh, lactoferrin levels than patients with uh, inactive disease uh, in green. I used to have all the bars in red, but it, it was hard to project, so I changed the bars to yellow. I kept the tops red uh, if, if the slide is, is puzzling you. But the bottom line is, is that uh, patients who have more active disease endoscopically have more uh, or elevated lactoferrin levels. Uh, our next scenario, uh, the parents of our patients with UC, probably older now than 12, are planning on taking an extended vacation to Europe. I certainly wish I could do that with my kids, but they're planning on a trip to Europe, and he feels well, but they're anxious. They're going to spend a lot of money and doing a lot of traveling, and they're going to be far away from you, who have been taking care of their son for low these many years, and they're concerned that he will flare. And there's a question of, can fecal biomarkers predict who will remain in remission and who will flare? Can you take a, a, a lactoferrin measurement at any given time point, especially in a patient who feels well, and use that information to predict whether or not that patient is more or less likely to get into trouble over the course of the next one or several months. And there is no great perspective data, but I can share with you some information that suggests that this may be the case. If you look at adult patients who have normal Mayo scores at endoscopy, these are patients who come in for surveillance endoscopy, and they have a normal Mayo score, and collect a lactoferrin level, and then follow them over the course of the next uh, several months. The question is, 
uh, is that patient who has a normal Mayo score likely to uh, remain in remission? These data were drawn from 160 patients who are in complete endoscopic remission, and they provided uh, uh, samples and then were followed over a 12-month period. If you looked at the lactoferrin levels at the time of their procedure or around the time of their procedure, those who had more elevated lactoferrin levels in the context of normal endoscopic appearance or near-normal endoscopic appearance were more, much more likely to relapse. So, yes, I think a person who has a more normal lactoferrin level is less likely to flare than a patient who has a more elevated lactoferrin level. Sort of looping back to what we said earlier, patients who have normal mucosa are less likely to flare than those who have abnormal mucosa. Patients who have normal histology are less likely to flare than those who have abnormal histology. So lactoferrin and other fecal biomarkers may be a way, may be a vehicle that we can offer our patients some reassurance or prognosis. Um, if you... Uh, look at patients at any given time point and you measure their lactoferrin level, all comers, these are patients who are well, measure a single lactoferrin level and see where they fall. The arbitrary cutoff from this study was 145, and this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. And what you see is that those who have elevated calprotect I'm sorry, elevated lactoferrin levels over time are much less likely to remain in remission. Not a surprise, but, but the important thing to remember is that these patients at baseline were clinically indistinguishable. The only thing that really differentiated them was their lactoferrin level. So following people who have Elevated lactoferrin levels over time is likely to lead you down the path of, of flare. So this is one way that you can uh, provide some, pro may be able to provide some prognostic information to that family interested in going to Disney World or London or Paris to try to figure out exactly where they are. Perhaps if they have an elevated lactoferrin level, you have to come up with a plan. I think you have to come up with a plan for all of your patients, but maybe that patient with elevated uh, lactoferrin travels with some steroids or travels with uh, antibiotics are in this day and age with the, the GI bulletin boards and other ways of keeping in touch that you connect people up with other uh, providers in different locations who may be available to help if your patient gets into trouble. Um, if you look at patients with Crohn's disease that have undergone ileocecal resection and then go back as is the case now, we typically go back within four to six to, to nine or 12 months and reassess that anastomotic site and assign them what is uh, the Rutgert score, which is pretty the this, this standardized metric for assessing the, the health or disease activity of the anastomosis. You can see that patients who have histologic remission, low Rutgut scores, and that's going to be an I0 or an I1, much lower, uh, much lower scores. I, I should step back and say that if you look at people who have no disease recurrence, people who have relatively low Rutgut scores, and the Rutgut scores can be interpreted as either the, the standard score or a modified, more easily assessed score. Patients with no disease recurrence, no endoscopic disease recurrence, had much lower lactoferrin levels than those who had significantly elevated uh, recurrence, meaning lots more mucosal disease evident. This is a, a, an endoscopic assessment, not a histologic assessment. So patients who have higher Rutgert scores, patients who have uh, larger, deeper, more circumferential ulcers around the anastomosis are much more likely to have uh, elevated uh, lactoferrin levels. Can you say that you could use lactoferrin uh, instead of uh, endoscopic studies for screening these patients? I'm not sure that we're really there just yet, uh, but... Uh, certainly uh, a, a different dimension along which you can collect very important prognostic information and perhaps serial measurements in the same patients 
over time are going to provide you with the most uh, useful information. And then cl uh, clinical scenario five, our patient who was 12 and is now 18 is heading off to college. Uh, he is less responsive to steroids, has to start infliximab, and wants to know whether the infliximab is working. Can we use fecal markers to monitor response to therapy? Now, remember I told you earlier that lactoferrin levels do change in response to therapy, especially steroids. Uh, it looks like that's the case for biologics as well, and this is an area of active uh, investigation for both uh, lactoferrin and calprotectin. If you look, this is a small population, these are five patients who started uh, Remicade uh, therapy. They had uh, lactoferrin levels checked at baseline prior to when they started therapy and then uh, further down after their first infusion, I think at the, at the beginning of their second infusion or third infusion. And what you can see is that those patients um, had a nice response to therapy, they felt better, and they had a pretty significant drop in their calprotectin levels so that uh, this may be a way of discerning who is more or less likely to respond to any particular therapy, whether it be Remicade or, or Humira or Simsia or one of the newer ones like Intivio or Stellara. So lactoferrin is going to play its role in discerning disease activity uh, in all these patients. And if we're trying to use expensive therapy, we have to have a way of knowing that the expensive therapy is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Endoscopic study is certainly, an, uh, is certainly an option, but not a readily accessible option and certainly not an acceptable option option if you ask your patients if they're interested in doing a clean out and, and undergoing uh, anesthesia or, or at least heavy sedation. Um, pay, my colleagues who, who are always interested in using lactoferrin and know about my passion often ask me, are there other diseases and conditions that can present with changes in lactoferrin levels? Is it 100% sensitive and 100% specific? No test is and there are other conditions. Lactoferrin can have low-grade elevations in any of these parameters. Now, I'm not certainly not going to read these to you, but I'm just going to tell you that you can get low positives. These are, are typically less than 50. Low positive lactoferrin levels with some infections, some malignancies, mercifully not many that we have to deal with in pediatrics, probably more relevant in adults. Um, non-steroidal responses, uh, and then a variety of other disorders that can give you low-grade uh, lactoferrin levels. What do I do with these low-grade lactoferrin levels in these patients? Uh, I recheck them. I see the patient in clinic. I get the workup, including lactoferrin and infectious studies. I might do some blood work. If they're feeling better overall, I might check that low level again in a month or two months or three months. If, it's per, if the patient is persistently symptomatic and the lactoferrin remains elevated, uh, albeit low, that's probably a kid I'm going to scratch my head and think a little bit about in terms of whether or not I want to commit them to an invasive procedure. If the lactoferrin normalizes and the patient looks well, that's probably a patient I'm going to do a whole lot less to. So knowing the level, knowing the level in the same patient over time is probably going to help guide your therapy uh, quite a bit when you're using fecal biomarkers like uh, lactoferrin. So I want to leave you with some take-home points. Uh, we've talked a bunch. Um, lactoferrin is a great biomarker to help sort out which patients that walk into your office or are seen in the emergency room uh, have inflammatory or infectious processes. Lactoferrin is likely to be useful in longitudinal assessment of patients who have inflammatory bowel disease. What we're doing is following the same patients or patient populations over time, and they're going to help us discern who's active and who's inactive and who's responding and who isn't responding. But we need much more research to determine how biomarkers can be leveraged to predict disease course and response to therapy and when therapy is especially useful or futile, and where fecal biomarkers fall in as surrogate markers for mucosal uh, disease. 
in uh, clinical trials or in clinical practice. And we just need more data, more specific data about when we can use this particular tool in a particular clinical circumstance. And that's um, where I'm going to stop. I do have uh, some time. We have about five or ten minutes that we can answer some questions if anybody uh, sent some in. Thank you so much, Dr. Rufo, for that informative presentation. We will now start that live Q&A portion of the webinar, and if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your questions into the box that appear on the screen, and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started and take our first question from our live audience. Our first question, Dr. Rufo, is are there any patient populations that work better with lactoferrin than calprotectin? What cutoffs do you use for lactoferrin? Do the cutoffs change for different patient populations? To add to that, I typically use calprotectin. calprotectin. Why should I use lactoferrin? Excellent. So. Lactoferrin and calprotectin are both proteins found in immune cells like neutrophils. So it's very hard to imagine a scenario in which a neutrophil would do its business or a neutrophil would burst um, and do its business and not release both lactoferrin and calprotectin. I think in studies that have been done, the correlation between the two levels is going to be about the same. Is there a population of patients for which one metric is more useful than the other? I don't think that there is. I think because neutrophils are neutrophils and they release lactoferrin and calprotectin at the same time, I'm not so sure that disease processes are going to select particular patient populations. Cutoffs, though. Cutoffs is really important because... The sensitivity and specificity of an assay is going to be depend on the cutoff. As you, draw, as you rise up your cutoff, you're going to increase your sensitivity, but you're going to lose some of your specificity. Initial studies for lactoferrin looked at levels of about 7. I think more of the commercial lactoferrin levels now are about 20. If it's 20 and below, I think it's negative. I think if it's 20 and above, it's positive. I think it's a low positive until it's between 20 and 50 to 80. I think once you get in triple digits, 100, you know, you're talking higher lactoferrin levels, and you can track it up into the into the thousands. So there is a, a three log range at least for for lactoferrin measurements. And depending upon what disease process you're looking for, and this has been especially utilized in calprotectin, will determine if you want to capture different patient populations, um, for instance, uh, in patients uh, that you're thinking about neck or necrotizing enterocolitis in pediatrics, because there's a large signal-to-noise ratio, you need to use a much higher calprotectin level uh, to, to discern who is more or less likely to have neck. Now, you can't use lactoferrin in this particular patient population because lactoferrin is found in considerable amounts in breast milk. So calprotectin is probably the, the marker to use uniquely in this patient population. Thank you, Dr. Rufo. Our next question is, we often encounter moderately elevated fecal lactoferrin results with calprotectin protectin levels that are well within the normal limit and vice versa. Could you provide some clinical scenarios where these findings could be expected? So I, if I think that, that I hear the question is you have some low positives and the question is what to do with a low positive or intermediate positives. And what I do with those patients is certainly I put them in clinical context and that means what was the patient's lactoferrin or calprotectin level when they were very sick, maybe at presentation, and what were the patient's calprotectin or lactoferrin levels were when you last saw them when they were feeling great in clinic. And that may give you your two endpoints, your two-point calibration and you can figure out where they fit along those curves. Patients who are closer to baseline may have a small subclinical or quasi-subclinical increase in disease activity that's being reflected in calprotectin. Or it could be that you have a patient who has 
uh, IBD and ulcerative colitis and a little bit of norovirus on top of that. Patients with IBD get the same diseases that other people get too. I think the important thing is going to be to put it in clinical context and repeat the study, especially if you're not going to have an intervention at a particular time. Just repeat the stool sample in a week or two or three and see if that's going to uh, help you decide if there's going to be a change in, in therapy. Thank you, Dr. Rufo, and thank you to our live audience, and I just want to remind them that any questions not answered today during our live participation will be answered via email. Our next question is, do you see the benefit of offering fecal lactoferrin in conjunction with fecal calprotectin as part of a profile? Yeah. So... Lactoferrin and calprotectin provide complementary information, and I don't think that we're limited to using either agent. Uh, for some reasons that we don't fully understand, changes in a patient's disease activity may be more reflective of changes in lactoferrin or changes in calprotectin. So you may find, as we understand these, these values better and these technologies better, that it may be that certain levels ring better for certain patients. Now, we know that patients where we get SED rates and CRPs on patients, they both reflect changes in uh, disease acuity, but we know that some people are more likely to to, to uh, manifest changes in this CRP before or um, in response to therapy more than SED rate. As gastroenterologists, do we typically get SED rates and CRPs? Absolutely. As gastroenterologists, could we consider getting uh, lactoferrin and calprotectin? Absolutely. In the few studies that I've seen that have it done, when you measure both samples, and you use them in combination, either in an additive or multiplicative said rate, uh, I'm sorry, lactoferrin times calprotectin or some component, when you add the two together, the, the, the stretch, the difference between the bars gets even larger. So if you measure, if a person has an abnormal lactoferrin and calprotectin, that group of patients is going to be much more discriminated with respect to inflammatory infectious versus non-inflammatory infectious than those who have lower levels. So used in conjunction, that's probably very useful. Useful. But I think you have to tailor it to the individual patients, just like we sort of think about SED rates and CRPs. I have some patients with uh, IBD who, who I mostly rely on their CRP or I mostly rely on their SED rate. It just depends on, on what their phenotype is. Thank you, Dr. Roof. I have time for one more question. What level of lactoferrin or calprotectin would trigger you to initiate more aggressive therapy as opposed to watch and wait? Now, that's a great question. So once again, I think you're going to have to view the two-point calibration that I hope you establish with all your patients, meaning what is, their, what is their fecal biomarker level when they're well and what is it when they're sick, oftentimes around diagnosis. That gives you a two-point calibration. In general, uh, for calprotectin, I think levels uh, in, in patients who have established IBD levels below 150 are, may raise your eyebrows. Once you get above 150, you're going to start thinking about whether or not you want to make a change. I think for lactoferrin, probably lower. I think once you get in the 20 to 50 range there, in the right clinical scenario, you're going to scratch your head a little bit more. When, once you get much above 50, and certainly once you get much above 100, that's when you're going to start thinking that, that there's been a significant change in, in clinical status. Thank you, Dr. Rufo. And would you like to provide the audience members with any final closing remarks before we close today? I challenge uh, everybody to use more of these very cost-effective, procedure-sparing uh, assays in their own clinical practice and see how they can be used to provide patients with reassurance and prognostic information. And I think that you'll find that the more you use them, uh, the more you'll come to rely on them. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Rufo, for your presentation and your important research.
I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when the webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.